Well, good morning. Man, I am excited to be here. How about you? I'm glad that you are too. Hey, my name is TJ, uh, pastor here at the shore. Um, and and I'm, I'm happy that you're here. If it's your first or second time with us, thank you so much for spending time with us. As uh, we saw in the announcements that there is a gift for you back there. Man, we'd love to give that to you. It's not going to anybody else but you, so you might as well take it, right? Uh, so, uh, and then also Growth Track. Uh, step two is today. It's the second Sunday of the month, and we run them the first four Sundays of every month. And if you're wondering what Growth Track is, uh, I, I just, let, me, let me tell you real quick. It's the perfect way for you to get connected here at the shore, but it's also the best way for you to help discover your purpose, and what, what God is calling you to, why he created you. That's what Growth Track is designed to do, to help you grow in your relationship with God and how he is uniquely calling you to discover something, to do something in the kingdom of God. And so that's what Growth Track is for. I highly encourage encourage you to take that. It's during second service and you may be going, well, is, uh, what do I do with my kids? Great. We have, we have child care through that entire service as well. So you can go in there and, and take advantage of growth track. All right. Uh, and this week uh, was a crazy week for Florida, wasn't it? Yeah, we got some crazy stuff going on. Hurricane Matthew. And, and what I want to do now is just let's pray for our, uh, our, our brothers and sisters, our fellow Floridians on the East Coast. Can we do that? And then also our, our, our neighboring countries like Haiti, who have had such devastation because of this. Let's take a moment now just to pray. Father, we thank you so much for, for keeping us um, in a place of security and refuge, Lord Jesus. And we pray right now, God, that you would be with those who are mourning and hurting uh, and I pray now that there would be a great amount of hope and peace within them because you, God, are on the scene. You, God, are working inside of them. And I pray that out of this devastation, Lord Jesus, that, that people would come to know you because of it. God, that you take a negative circumstance and you use it in a positive way so that you, God, get all the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, at the end of service, we will pass uh, uh, some buckets around and you got an envelope. If you want to donate to help one of our, our, our missions organizations that we've already partnered with um, to help Florida and uh, countries uh, that have been devastated by the hurricane, whatever you give, just write hurricane on the envelope. That way I know to send it directly over to some of our partners in Haiti and here in Florida, all right? So we are in week number two of this series called Detox. And last week was amazing. I had so much fun teaching you guys about detox. And you may be going, well, TJ, I missed last week. What is detox? What is detox? Because you know what uh, like a physical detox is, right? You know, like, all right, I'm not allowed to eat Krispy Kremes anymore. That's what you know, right? Like, but, but it's so much more than physical. Although we do have physical things going on within us, there's also a spiritual side and, and, a, and a soul, an emotional side of who we are, right? So we're so much more than just the physical body. So we don't need to just detox the the, the body, and that's important. We need to do detoxes there. We need, there's addictions that have holds on us and, and things that our body wants to do that we should not do, right? We need, we need to break down some of that stuff. But we also need to work on our soul. We've got hurts in our past, pains from when we were a kid, uh, fear and anxiety over the future. That's, that's in our soul. And then spiritually, there's things in our life that only God can heal. Only God can, can work within us. And so this series is, is dedicated to helping you find uh, mind, body, and soul, and spirit to help detox in that way, to, to kind of grow in, in, in that realm. So this series is five weeks long. If you missed last week, you can pick it up on our website, theshorechurch.com. You can watch it on YouTube. You can listen on a podcast or on our app for iOS and Android. I mean, there's like almost unlimited ways that you can get a hold of that message last week. Uh, whatever your preference is, we've pretty much got it, all right? So, so pick that up last week. Um, that was kind of the starter step. Now this week, we're gonna dive into something a little more specific. Uh, we we, we kind of gave you that overview last week. This week, we're gonna talk about the thing that I think we all need to detox from first, and that is comparison. 
Because comparison, when we compare ourselves to someone else, we actually, we actually get uh, kind of some stuff stuck to our soul. We, we actually kind of feel less about ourselves. And, and, and you may be going, well, TJ, I don't really compare myself to other people. Or what is comparison? Well, comparison is really looking for other people as a standard instead of God. And you may be going, well, TJ, I definitely don't do that. Okay, let's, let's get a scenario together. You guys ready? You're at, the, you're at Publix. You're, you're shopping for groceries, right? You got one, two, three, four, five. Five items, okay? So where do you go? Do you go to the long line or the express line? Ten items or less, baby. Let's go over there, right? And so, so you make your way over to the items in line, but you notice the person in front of you, their cart looks a little more full than yours. What are you doing? You start counting their junk, don't you? As soon as they pull it out, one, two, they got 12 items, right? I don't compare myself to other people, but if I did, I'm way better than that guy, right? You, you know you do it. You're, you're always, or, or you get in a line, and you've got a bunch of stuff, and someone else gets in another line that you were thinking about getting in, but you didn't know if you are supposed to get in it, so you got in this line because you're trying to figure out which line's going to be faster. And if they get out of line before you, oh my gosh, right? But if you get out, if you get out of line first, you're like, it's going to be a good day. Man, I beat that guy in the line race, right? You, what do you do? You're comparing yourself to someone else, aren't you? We all do it, but, we, but it's so ingrained in who we are, we don't even know that we compare ourselves. We, we don't even know that, that, that life is this giant competition. It, it, it shouldn't be, but we, we treat it like that sometimes, don't we? That this competition between us and them, and they have something, we can't have it. And I think it's mostly fueled by, by social media. I think we kind of have fallen into this trap of social media. I'm not, I'm not anti-social media, but if we use it in the wrong way, isn't there a lot of comparison going on there? Like when I go on social media, I see everybody's highlight reel, Right? Like, 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 it's like sports center top 10, right? Oh, look at this beautiful family photo and, and we're doing things. I'm, 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 I'm having my day off and, and I, I have a brand new car and all this stuff is going through my feed. Like, oh my gosh, I hate all of you, right? Like, 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 like there's this jealousy that comes out. But, but here's the deal. Social media, it's a total lie. Cause, cause, because if I compare my everyday life to everyone else's highlight reel, won't I feel bad about myself? That's comparison. We can't do that. This, this week, um, I was guilty of that. I, I was totally a liar on social media. Did you know that? I did go fishing on Monday, and this did happen. Check this out. Yeah, I, I got I to have an excuse. I, I caught my first tarpon this weekend, this Monday, right? Oh, oh, that get, beautiful. And you guys are going, I don't care. But there's some guys in the room going, TJ, where was that? You need to take me next time, all right? Or some ladies in the room thinking that. But that was my first tarpon, slow motion. Oh my gosh, best day ever. But then uh, earlier that morning, I took a picture. I was, and, and I'm on the boat and it's my friend, Nick Williams. He's, he's a pastor at South Shore Church. So we're friends with each other and we, we went fishing on Monday, our day off. Like we're like, okay. And I even hashtagged it, pastor's day off. Mm, right there, pastor's day off. <laughs> So me and Pastor Nick, we're going fishing. And so we're, we're going, so he's on the phone. He had to take care of something. So I snap a pic and I go on my Instagram and I put it up there and I, ha and I tag um, Nick Williams. But I'm like, I don't know what that underscore 98 means, but I'm just going to put Nick Williams on there, right? Because it's Nick, it's Pastor Nick right here. Well, a couple minutes later, someone commented on there. Oh my gosh, TJ, you know everyone. I can't believe you're on a boat with Nick Williams. I'm like, Nick, bro, these people love you. They love you. And, 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 and then I did a little digging there, like, and then they go, I'm from Kansas City. I love him too. I'm like, Nick, you from Kansas City? He goes, no, I have never been to Kansas City. I'm like, what is going on? And so I, I, I look at this Nick Williams right here. This is Nick Williams' defensive end for the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> Professional football player. He must have heard my sermon last week. Said, bro, we need to talk about that. Let me take you out on a boat today. Like, that's a, it, right? Like, he just wanted to go fishing with me, is what Nick, but here I am, total lie, total lie, right? But I did go on a boat on Monday, so I like, that's my highlight reel, right? But, the, but here, here's what we do, right? We, we look at everyone else's highlight reel and we go, oh, my life is so terrible. I don't have any money. I don't have any friends. I don't have, blah, blah, blah. My, my marriage is terrible. My kids misbehave. And you think everybody else's life is so much better, but the truth is that's just their highlights, Right? It's a total lie. I was reading in the book of Isaiah the other day, and, uh, and it's talking about uh, this, this guy will ch chop down a tree, and he'll use part of the wood to carve an idol, like something to worship. Then he'll take the rest of the wood and burn it. 
And then Isaiah's going, <laughs> look at the irony in this. You'll worship one piece of wood, but you'll burn another piece of wood. He, he's going, is it holy or isn't it? Why are you doing this? And then I love this last line in verse 20, Isaiah 44, verse 20. He says this, the poor deluded fool feeds on ashes. He trusts something that can't help him at all, yet he cannot bring himself to ask. And this is the critical question. This is this one I want to bring to you guys. Is this idol that I'm holding in my hand a lie? Is what I'm holding in my hand a lie? And, and, I, and as soon as I read that verse, I pictured us holding our phones in our hand, going through Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and whatever new social media site that I don't know about yet that you guys are trying to get me to use that I don't like it anyway. So, <laughs> right? And, and, and I'm going through this and I'm going, and I'm going, is this idol that I'm holding, is it a lie? Is, is what I see right here a lie? And the truth is what? Yes. Don't, if it's on Facebook, you probably shouldn't believe it, right? Oh, this political season, oh my gosh, Lord help us all, right? This, no matter what, is this, is what I'm seeing a lie? So we need, to, we need to do something about this, don't we? Otherwise we get thrown into this comparison trap where we compare our lives to someone else. And, and that's not healthy for us. That's not healthy. We, we need to start changing the way we think, the way we respond. And I don't think that you should avoid people who are successful in your life, successful. And I don't think you should, should uh, avoid people who are having their best day and putting their highlight. I don't know if you should avoid that. But I do think we need to change the way we react to some of these things. Because if our first initial thought is a comparison, and we think that if they have something and I don't, that means that they're more blessed than me. And that if God's blessed them, he can't bless me. I think our attitude is wrong. Because God is not a God who goes, I'm going to bless you and not you. I think, I think it's the wrong thinking. I think if we think they have and I can't because they have, all of a sudden we feel like there's this, this scarcity mentality, right? But God's not a God of scarcity. He doesn't say, I can bless them but not you because I gave it all to them. God owns everything. If he's going to give it to them, he can give it to you too, right? But here we are with this attitude, oh my gosh, I can't. I'm not going to like that. Can you believe in that? Right? We get this attitude, don't we? We're you know, comparing my life to theirs. And, and so this morning, what I want to do is I want to take you to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 10. And there's this short little story, really, really short story in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And I, and I want to read, set it up for you and read it to you. And I think there's two groups of people in this story that we can compare ourselves to and find out what kind of person we are and who we should be in this comparison world. Okay, so there's this guy named Saul. And, and Saul... Um, had a dad, his dad had some donkeys and his dad lost his donkeys. It's kind of a funny sentence to me too. I don't know, it just sounds weird. So Saul goes to find his dad's donkeys. That's what he's doing. And, 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 and as he's going to find his dad's donkeys, there's this prophet named Samuel, the guy who wrote this book. And God speaks to Samuel and he says, Samuel, the next king of Israel, in fact, the first king of Israel, because Israel's never had a king at this point. Uh, he goes, the first king of Israel is, is finding his father's donkeys. Uh, just tell him that the donkeys are found and that he's going to be the next king. And so as Saul's walking into a city, Samuel's walking out of a city, they meet each other. And Sa Saul goes, hey, have you seen my dad's donkeys? And Samuel goes, nope, the donkeys are, donkeys are found, but you need to come with me. So they go to this place of worship and he, and, and he presents him to the entire uh, town in that area. They're worshiping God. And, and he goes, this guy's going to be the next king. And Saul's like, I was just looking for some donkeys, bro. Like, I just don't, I don't know what's happening. So, so this is kind of this odd interaction. And then this happens. Check it out. Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. And then the next part of this verse, or this passage, Saul also went to his home at Gibeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. So, the, so there's people that say, okay, the, Saul has become king, and, and, and I want to serve this king. So, so God has moved in their life. But some worthless fellows said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present. And then I love this last line, but he held his peace. But he held his peace. In, in our context today, if we say someone holds their peace, it means they're just, I'm just gonna keep my mouth shut. If you don't have anything nice to say, you don't say anything at all, right? That's what mama always taught me. And so, and so he, just, he keeps his mouth shut in this. But I think it's so much more than just keeping his mouth shut with these people who are critical of him because he's just been put, he just became king. There's, there's a crown on his head now. And God gave him some peace, and he is not willing to give it away to the critics. Think about that for a minute. When God does something in your life, and there are some people that are critical of what God is doing, your peace is not for sale, is it? Is your peace for sale to the highest critic, or can you just kind of Taylor Swift it? Right? 
Because the player's going to play, 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 play. <laughs> and the hate is going to hate, hey, 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 hey. And I'm just going to shake, 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 right? Shake it off. And, and Saul says that. It's what he does. He goes, he goes, you know what? I don't care what you have to say. Because you didn't give me my peace. So you can't take it away. I can give it away, but I'm going to hold on to it because God gave me this peace. And if God gives me peace, I'm not going to give it away to the loudest critic in the room. Not even possible. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm only going to be there with God. And so, so that's Saul. He, he reacts in that way. But what I really want to highlight from this passage is not necessarily Saul's reaction, but the reaction of the two people or the two groups of people that see him become king. Because just like our world, we see someone successful, there's one of two ways we can take it. We can be the worthless fellows who are like, how can this man save us? Or we can be the person of valor. Where we say, okay, God, you've stirred my heart, and I want to respond well to this situation. We have a choice to be one or the other. And I want to kind of break out these two different groups. And we're going to start out with some worthless fellows. That's exactly what the verse says, some worthless fellows. And so the scenario is Saul's become king, and we get to react. We get to react. And maybe you don't know any kings. I don't know any kings. Uh, but, but I know some people in my life that have been successful that God's blessed them, that they've, they've got great relationships, they've got finances, they've got things and stuff and jobs and whatever else, and God's blessed them. We can react in this way. We can be some worthless person speaking negative over the life. Look at what it says in 1 Samuel verse 27 of chapter 10. He says, how can this man save us? They start complaining. They start, they start agonizing over, oh, this guy Saul, he's just a normal guy. How can he be the one that saves us? Why would God choose him? If, if he could have chose me, but he chose him. Why did he do that? I've got better ideas than him. I'm so much better at my job than he's at, better at his job. He can't even find the donkeys. I could find the donkeys in 30 minutes, man. Like, like whatever. He, there's this comparison thing going. And the comparison spirit, if you take it in a negative way, quickly becomes a critical spirit. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever been embittered just when you saw something nice happening in someone else's life? Ouch, right? So I've got four questions for you this morning that will help us identify if we are living as a, um, one of these fellows that aren't so good, okay? So the critical guys, okay? So the first question is this. Are you exhausted trying to be like fill in the blank? Are you exhausted trying to be like so-and-so? Like, you're, are, you trying to, are you exhausted trying to be like your cousin, your brother-in-law, your coworker? The, the perfect mom at your kid's school that always seems to be doing everything perfect with the, the lunches that they make and they go in and they read the books to all the children, the poor children, right? And then they drive the perfect car and they have the perfect marriage. Are you, are you exhausted trying to be like somebody else? Maybe you're comparing a little bit too much, right? Another question. Are you broke trying to keep up with someone? And they got a new car. I got to get a new car, right? My, my, my coworker is, is, is living this lifestyle, so I got to live this lifestyle, or, or this or that. Are you broke trying to keep up with someone? Are you trying to live a life that you really can't afford just so you can keep up with the uh, Joneses, right? You might, you might be struggling with this comparison spirit. Uh, next one. Are you pushing your kids or, or your spouse so that they will be the best version of themselves or so they won't embarrass you? Or so uh, I don't want to be embarrassed by my kids, so I yell at them on the soccer field. Ref, are you kidding me, ref? And you, get a, you guys know those people, right? Maybe you are those people. <laughs> or, or do you feel the need to a- apologize for your spouse? Oh, he's just a big dumb animal. I'm sorry, right? <laughs> Why do you do that? Is it because you're embarrassed? Or are you trying to get them to be the best? Like, right? What, what is it? What is it? So are, are you, is that your motivation? Which one is it? And then the last one, this is the one that really gets us all. Who do you secretly wish would fail? Mm, if that A plus kid in your class would just get one F, your life would be complete. If the perfect mom, if you went to Target one day and saw their toddler melting down, you'd be like, I, that, that's what I came for, right there, <laughs> shopping over, right? Like, what, what? It's funny, it's funny, but you know, but that's true, right? So instead of empathizing with them and, and wanting to be there for them, we're like, I knew, I knew they weren't that perfect. Right? And we, we secretly wish they were. See, you know what the Bible calls that? Some worthless fellows. And that's, that, that attitude has quickly led a lot of people into dark places. That comparison attitude. Oh, I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. That person probably lied on the resume to get that job. I know that their life really isn't that perfect. They're so fake. Everything about them. And we start accusing and are critical of others. Why? Because we've got this comparison spirit. 
But look what it says in Proverbs chapter 14. I love this. He says, a heart at peace. Remember Saul had peace and he wasn't willing to give it away? A heart at peace gives life to the body. I mean, you, if you have peace, you, you have life inside of you. But check this out. Envy, envy will rot your bones. There's something inside of you that will get broken down. So what, are we going to give away our peace just because someone else is successful? Or are we going to hold on to our peace and know that God, if God can do it for them, he can do it in me too. So, so that, that, that's one way to identify whether, we're not, whether or not we're, we're kind of identifying with um, those worthless fellows, as the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel says. Or what, what was the second group? The second group was a person of valor. And, and I love the next sentence how it says, whose hearts God had touched. So, so, so God moved inside of them. They didn't respond in their natural inclination of if, if he gets a blessing, I can't have a blessing. But instead they go, oh, oh, God's doing something in him. Well, I want to be a part of what God's doing. If God's moving in this direction, I want to be a part of what God is doing. And they, and they submitted themselves not to, to the king, but really to God. And, and they say, if, if God is moving, I want, I want, my heart has been touched by God, and I want to move with God. And so that's the second response. So, so when they, he became king, they're like, okay, I'll follow him. When, when that person got a brand new vehicle, I'm going to go, dude, that is so awesome. I'm so proud of you, working hard. When, when, when that, that person uh, does really well and they get the promotion at work, the one we wanted, we shake their hand and say, congratulations. We celebrate and we rejoice with them, right? It's so important to do that because it, it, de- it takes the power that comparison can have in our life and it, and it takes it away and actually gives us a different kind of strength where we celebrate instead of criticize people. Does that make sense? All right, so here, here's one sentence that I want you to kind of root in your heart today. If you're not taking notes, I get it. This is one sentence you should write down though, okay? This is one thing I want you to kind of burn in your heart. Th- th- this is it. We cannot become what we have not seen or heard. Th- this, is, this is important to the comparison thing. This, this is the key to switching from the critical spirit to the celebratory spirit. From, from when we look at someone else who, who's doing well and we go, oh my gosh, they probably faked it or lied or whatever else, to, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And, and, and I want to have that happen in my life, so I'm going to celebrate what they did. This is the key right here. We cannot become what we have not seen or heard. Luke chapter 8, verse 18 tells us this. This is Jesus talking to some of the followers, some of the disciples. He goes, so pay attention how you hear. How you hear. Not, not that you're hearing, but make sure, make sure you hear well. Make sure you're listening to the right things. Make sure you're putting the right things in front of you. To those who listen to my teaching, so so they're listening to the right things, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what they think they understand will be taken away from them. He goes, if you hear well, more is going to be poured on top of you. But but if you listen poorly, if you don't put the right things in front of you, uh, all of a sudden, what you do have is actually going to be taken away. Let let, let me give you an example. The other day, um, I think it was Thursday, I was in my office working, and uh, Pastor Jared and Pastor Corey come in. And they're standing there. They go, hey, TJ, we have an idea that would make us super productive. And I'm like, how much is it going to cost me? Right? Like just, <laughs> what do you guys want? Right? And they go, okay, you got to check out this desk. It's, I knew what they wanted. Right? They wanted money. Okay. But it's such a good deal. I'm like, oh, whatever. Okay. So they say, so come over to my computer. I search for this desk. Right? And, and, and it's, a, it's a sit desk. And then you hit a button and it turns into a standing desk. Ooh. Super productive and healthy at the same time, right? Okay, so here they, here they are. They're like, they're talking to me about it. And I'm like, okay, you know what's really productive? If you're not in my office and you're in yours working. Okay, so go away from me. Get out of here. And, and so, so I cleared that screen and, and I'm doing research for this message and I'm reading articles and things like that. And, and all of a sudden, after I searched for that sit, sit, stand, weird desk thing that they talked about, all of a sudden, every article I was on, on the sides were, were advertisements for, guess what? that desk. Exact desk, exact company, exact colors that I was selecting, right? Think about that for a minute. Think about it in this context. What I listened to or what I put in, I got back. In your life, whatever whatever you're searching after, whatever you're listening to, whatever you're putting understanding in your life, you're going to get it back even more. But if you don't listen well, guess what? (laughs) It's not going to go well. So, so when, I, when I listen to music, man, I'm listening to music that builds me up, not tears other people down. Well, when I, when I go watch a television show, I don't want to watch a television show that, that, that will pour poorly into me because I will get more of that in my life. 
Jesus takes it even further with Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. He didn't talk just about the ears, but he talks about your eyes. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. So it's not what you see going out. It's actually what's coming in that he's talking about. And then he goes on to say, but if your eyes are unhealthy, what you look at is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. You need to be careful what you hear is that's Luke chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 6. He's going, be careful what you see. Make sure you're bringing in the right things because whatever you bring in will ultimately determine what you get more of. So you've been wondering why your relationships are a mess. Well, like you, you, you keep fighting with your spouse or your friends or whatever else. Could it be that you go home every night and you watch television shows where every relationship in that television show is dysfunctional and what you put in, you're just getting back? Could it be that if you're struggling with lust and you've been looking some things that you don't need to be looking at, and you're just getting more of what you've been putting in? Everybody follow me with that? Could, could that be? We, we need to make sure that we put the right things in our life because, ev- because we create environments in our lives, ecosystems, in the people we talk to and the, the media we consume and, and the way we react to social media. We actually create ecosystems. In my house, on my wall, there's a thermostat. And, and I can set that thermostat, I set it to 76 degrees, right? 76. And in my air conditioning unit, and all the things in my house, they work to keep my house at that exact temperature. Now, I could get the hottest cup of coffee and put it on the counter, and what temperature will that coffee end up being? 76 degrees, right? It started out hot, but eventually what will happen? It will cool down because I've created an ecosystem that everything in my life will get to that temperature. Everything. The same is true in our mind. We create an ecosystem that everything that goes on in our life will eventually settle at that exact point. So you come into church, oh my gosh, God is so awesome. That, that sermon was fire. The worship was amazing. By Tuesday afternoon, you're like, God, do you even exist? Why? Because once something that was hot got in your ecosystem, it began to come down, right? So what do you need to do? You can't just find, well, that church wasn't really working for me. No, no, no. Maybe it's not the church. Maybe it's the ecosystem that you've created. Maybe it's what you're consuming with your life. Maybe, maybe it's some of the friendships that you have, that they're critical. Have you ever noticed how a critical person will find another critical person, like, immediately? Like, like it doesn't take long for them to gang up. Like, all of a sudden, we've got hundreds of people in our church. One critical person walks in. I'm sure they could find another critical person in, like, one service. Because there's a language, there's an understanding, because what you consume, you're going to get back to you. But there's also the same is true. When I f- try to find joy in my life, when I'm chasing after the peace of God and I'm worshiping him, guess what's going to start coming back to me? That's why we're so big on connect groups here. But like, like we, we believe that relationships really, really matter to help create, create ecosystems and environments for you to be healthy. So we tell you, go to small groups. Go to our connect groups so that you can learn and grow and, 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 and have those relationships. Ladies, we have a women's event Saturday night you want to start changing some ecosystems, go hang out with those ladies, right? They're going to rock your world, I promise you. And they're going to bring the temperature up in your life, which means you've got to drop off some other people sometimes because they're, they're bringing your ecosystem down. Not that you don't love them, not that you don't reach out to them. St- every single person in existence is worthy to be reached out to, but not every single person in, is, in existence is meant to influence your life. You can influence them, but you can't let them influence your ecosystem. Does that make sense? So you got to get in those relationships. Huge, relationships are huge. Let me take this one step further, okay? So let, let's set up a couple scenarios and see what God is doing. Um, so he's talking about you, you, you have to be careful what you see. You have to be careful what you hear. And the sentence I gave you was you cannot become what you have not seen or heard. You cannot become what you have not seen or heard. You have to, you have to discover the tangible parts of it. You have to discover the reality of it. So, so maybe you're in here and you're single. Any single people here? All right. Y'all looked at each other. Done. I got, I got you that far. Okay. On the way out, you can do the rest. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just playing with you. All right. But never said it never did anything for you. All right. But say you're single and you really, really, really want to be in a relationship. You, you want to get engaged. You want to get married. You want to do that whole thing. But God keeps putting married people or engaged people in your path. And you're like, God, do you seriously hate me that much? 
But God, come on, like, like I've been looking for single people and you've only ever sent me people who are engaged or married or all in love and I hate it, man. I hate it. But God's not sending them to you to make you miserable. He's sending them to you to show you what the possibility is for your life. Because you cannot become what you have not seen or heard. And he's trying to put something in front of you to show you what your life could be but we can either act like the worthless fellows and go, oh my gosh, and get all critical over their lovey doveyness or we can go, you know what, I'm going to celebrate that because if God can do it for that guy, he can do it for me. <laughs> if God can hook that girl up, oh my gosh, he can do it for me, right? And all of a sudden, if our attitude changes just a little bit, we're set up for success, aren't we? Yeah. So, so maybe your marriage is on the rocks and God keeps sending you happily married people. How do you react? Well, I'm not going to hang out with those people, right? They, they, they make me feel bad. No, they don't make you feel bad. God's showing you what your life could become, but you cannot survive this season of your life unless you see hope on the other side. Does that make sense? If you don't have a job, the last thing you want to do is hang out with someone who has a job. When you're struggling financially, the last thing you want to do is talk to the person that's like, I have so much money, I don't know what to do with it, right? But here's Johnny Rich over here like that, and you're going, oh my gosh, I hate that guy, but God put him in your life so that you can see that if he can do it for him, he can do it in you. And it's the difference between the scarcity mentality and, and the mentality that God really wants us to have, the, the person of valor that we've been talking about. We can say, well, God, you gave it all to them and there's not enough, enough left for me. You really think God is that broke? No, God owns everything, and if he can do it in them, he says, I can do it in you too. And I've been trying to put it in front of you so that you could see what you can become, but you've been rejecting it for years. Stop rejecting it and begin to embrace it. Does that make sense to everybody? Be careful what you see. Be careful how you hear, because God's putting things in front of you. Don't reject it. Don't push it away. Actually embrace it. Uh, there was a study done in the 1950s, and it's not particularly uh, humane, but it was the 1950s, but they did a study with rats, okay? So, so the rat dies. I got to give you that right now, okay? The rats die, and it's in a terrible, terrible way. So if you're sensitive, I'm really, really sorry, but it is a rat. And if they were in your house, you'd be like, kill it, kill it, kill it, right? That's what you would do. So, so, so they did a study with these rats, and, um, and, and they put them in a, a, a cylinder of water, and they couldn't get out, and they timed how long it takes the rats to drown. That's pretty brutal, right? Uh, and in this story, we're the rats, just so you know, okay? And when I wrap it up at the end. And so they would time how long it takes, sometimes 30 minutes, sometimes an hour, but the rats would eventually succumb and drown. In, in, in the second test, they knew how long the rats could survive. And so right about when they were about to drown, they would take the rats out of the water for a couple seconds and then put them back in and let them go again. But something incredible happened. Once they pulled them out one time, they didn't, they didn't survive just for 30 minutes to an hour. They could swim up to three days once they were scooped out one time and put back in. How is that even possible? Like they were on the verge of death, and then all of a sudden they could go for three more days. How, wh what's the difference? They got a picture of what hope looked like. They got a picture of what it looked like to be rescued. You see, they became, they, they, they held out hope for what they could become. You may be at the end of your rope right now. Like, I can't, I can't do this. I can't survive this anymore. I don't have what it takes. God, I'm about to drown. I'm going down. I'm about to let go of my rope. And God goes, you need to find a rat that's already been saved and start hanging out with that rat. Because the rats you've been hanging out have already drowned. You need to get away from them. You need to go find one of those rats that have been rescued and start spending time with that rescued rat and, and, and get involved in their life because I want to show you what it's like to be saved. That's what God wants to do inside of us. I heard a story this week about two Marines, or sorry, Navy SEALs. They were going through the Navy SEAL training and they were off the coast of California in those frigid waters of the Pacific. And, and, and it was their last test and one, one, one seal made it to the beach and became a Navy SEAL. And the other guy was about 100 yards offshore, and he could not make it. His body was seizing up on him, exhausted physically, could not go anymore. And he tried everything within him to keep going, and he just could not do it. And about the time that he was about to go down, go under, he looked at the beach, and he saw his friend on the beach. And his friend caught his eye, and he looked at him, and he said one word, Go. And all of a sudden, he says, everything within me came alive. And he finished that, that, that day. He became a Navy SEAL as well. What happened? 
His body could not move anymore. But what happened? He could not become what he had never seen or heard. And all of a sudden, he saw that it was possible. And, and, and something came alive within him when that person that had made it said, you can do it too. That's why we do these small groups. That's why we come into a church. That's why we go to the men's events and the women's events of our church. That's why we do these things. Because I need to surround myself with people that have made it. And if your relationships are struggling, maybe you should find some that aren't. And if you're working financially and it's just not working, you, you need to get to a place where you can find some people that have their finances working. Or if your health is failing, find someone that God has already healed, done something inside of them. Get around those kind of people because it's the, it's the people that have been there that can help walk you through it. They can give you hope. The other people in life, they can't give you hope because they've never been saved. They've never been rescued. So we've got to be careful what we put in because what we have, more will be given to us. And we cannot become what we've not seen or heard. So we need to be careful. We, we, we see what we hear and work in our life. Now, e each week, I told you, I'm going to give you an action step. I'm going to give you an action step because we're talking about this rule of five. And last week, I talked about the rule of five. And the example I gave you was um, there's uh, like, like a giant tree. You want to chop down this giant tree. But it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of, and, and, and many times we don't have the time or effort to, to go through a lot of things in life. But if you took an axe and you walked out there every single day and swung that axe five times, eventually, if you did it every day, that tree would fall over, right? But you have to go every day. You have to do it every day. And today, through this series, there's five weeks, and I said, I'm, we're going to give you five things that you can do every day so that you can chop down the giant trees in your life, so you can detox, so you can get rid of some of the things. And so last week, I gave you an action step. The first action step was this. Time with God every day this week, and I want you to do that again this week. I want you to set aside 5, 10, 20 minutes every single day. Every single day just to spend with God. Just to say, God, uh, I'm going to read the Bible. Will you speak to me? Read the Bible for a little while. Get on a reading plan from uh, Bible.com or on your Bible app. You can jump on one of those. And okay, God, I'm going to read. And, and then after you're done reading that section for the day, you can go and say, okay, God, help me put this in my life. And that's just time. Every day with God doing that. Just, just putting it before him. And then the second action step for this week I want you to add in is, is some of you, you need to take a break from social media because it's been consuming you. Others of you, you, you don't need to take a complete break. You just need to change your attitude with it. Because if we go on social media and we're like, ah, that person is doing this or is doing that and I don't like this, you either need to hide that person that's like overly political and they're making you mad, right? Like something like that. Or, or you need to like something because, because you want to be around the people that are doing it right. So as, as an example, for me, I'm a pastor of a church. I bet you knew that already. Okay. I'm friends with a lot of pastors all over the nation. And, and some of these pastors that I know are just, their cities are absolutely being transformed with the gospel. And, and whenever they preach, uh, like people are getting saved. And, and their churches are growing. They're making a huge impact in their community. I was at a church last night. 129 people got, got baptized last weekend alone. I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And part of me, I have, to, I have to choose whether I'm going to act like some worthless fellow and go, oh my gosh, they're watering down the gospel and they're a secret church and all these other negative things, right? Or I can go, you know what? I'm going to like it. I'm going to like it by faith, knowing that if God can do that in their city, that Sarasota will look different by the time we're done with it. I can like it by faith. And some of you need to go on your Facebook or your Twitter feed or your Instagram and start liking the junk out of some things that, you're, that you are going, okay, I have, cannot become what I have not seen or heard. So you need to start seeing the right things and hearing the right things and having the right attitude in the process. Does that make sense? Break from social media. Did, did you know uh, there was a study done um, that people who are Facebook users, and I'm not anti-Facebook, but this, these statistics will kind of make you think that way, um, that, that if people stop using Facebook for one week, they're 6% happier by the end of that week. I don't know about you. I, could be, I would like to be 6% happier. How about you? After one week. Imagine what two weeks or three weeks could do. Um, there, there's, there's another study done by the, uh, the same organization that the people who use Facebook are um, about 39% more unhappy than those who have stopped using the site. Why is that? Comparison, right? Instead of celebrating what God's doing in someone else's life, they just go, oh, they're so critical. Uh, there's, have you, there's just fights on Facebook and, and there's comments and people are getting offended and all these other things. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. So some of you guys, you need to take a step back from social media. Some of us need to just process the way we react to it a little better, that we can be worthless fellows or people of valor 
Which one is it going to be? We need to make that choice today. All right, I got one more verse for you from the book of Romans, chapter 10. And we're going to wrap the service with this. And I think this verse um, will apply to every single one of us, but in different ways. Just depending on where you are in your relationship with God. It says this, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And that might be some of us in here. We, we don't yet believe on God, but, but we're, we're close. We're, we're getting there. We're, we're, we're going to call on him to save us. We don't have a relationship, but God is moving us in that direction. And how can they believe in him if they have never heard? They're, see, you can't become what you haven't seen or heard. You see that there? Okay. Heard about him. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Now, each one of us are probably in a different part of this verse. Some of you in here, you're, you've been so distant from God. You don't, this is your first time in the church in a really long time. You feel like God's a million miles away. Today, your step is what we see right here. Call on him to save me. Because today, I, I believe. I believe. Why? Because I heard. And how did we hear? Because someone told me. And that's where some of you are. <laughs> you're the rat that's been saved. <laughs> And God is asking you, go find someone who's drowning and give them some hope. Because God did something in you. Don't keep it to yourself. And so, so we're going to pray in a moment. And I'm going to pray for two things. One, that those of us in here that are, that are distant and far from God, that today we would trust him with our entire life. And we would experience what the Bible calls salvation. But then the other half of that prayer is, for those of you who have already prayed that salvation prayer, that you wouldn't stay silent, but in fact, you would begin to share that, hey, I have been saved. I've been rescued. And there's this hope like, like nothing before. It's just amazing hope. So if you don't mind, maybe close your eyes and bow your heads just so there's no distraction, so that you can just have a moment with God. Don't, don't even pay attention to me. Just I want you talking to God right now. No one moving around, kind of silence, so that we can pray together and you can talk with God. If you're here this morning, you say, you know what, TJ, that's me. <laughs> I need salvation. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Or if you're in here and you say, you know what, TJ, I need to tell the world about this salvation. God, give me the strength. Let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, this morning we pray that first and foremost, we would start a relationship with you. Forgive us of the things in our life that have separated us from you, that the brokenness that, that often creeps into our life. And I pray that you would forgive us of our sins. Make us new in you. We want to experience you and your salvation, God. I, I pray also now, God, that, that those of us who have been saved, that have been rescued, that we wouldn't keep it to ourselves, Lord, but that we would look at the world around us and, and show them, God, <laughs> that you are a God who saves. And in that, Lord Jesus, we would call people closer to you, that you would do something in their life. Thank you, Father. In your name we pray. And everybody says... Amen. Why don't you put your hands together for those people that have prayed that prayer.